chapter 9 in our series on 1 Corinthians. Uh, and then we'll jump right into chapter 10 next week, I guess. So, uh, what we are doing, if you are visiting with us, just to give you a brief moment of explanation, we're going through, kind of step-by-step step through the book of 1 Corinthians, which is a letter uh, written by a man named Paul to a community of faith in a city called Corinth, which is where, of course, it gets its name first. Corinthians, and then there's also a second Corinthians. Um, maybe we'll do that someday too. I don't know. Uh, but uh, so this is a letter that was written to, in some ways, address lots of different problems and lots of different issues, and uh, also to give some just sort of practical advice on the, the best way for these people to move forward in the difficulties of their position in the city of Corinth, which was basically filled with all sorts of different cultural influences, uh, religious influences, political influences, and all kinds of um, different things that were opposed to the way of Jesus that the Corinthians were trying to live. And thank goodness we don't know what that's like, do we? Okay, so maybe we do. All right, so that's, uh, that's just the basic setup for what we're doing in our series in 1 Corinthians. So I want to begin the message, I guess, by asking you a question. How many of you, and you can raise your hands or not raise your hands, it's up to you. How many of you would say that you are presently a fully committed and fully active member of the kingdom of God, participating in the mission of God? One! Excellent! <laughs> you have no idea how good. There are a few, a few of you. This is, this thing that we're doing, this church business that we're up to, this isn't about us. This isn't about my comfort. This isn't about doing things the way I like to do them or the way you like to do them. We are here because we are on a mission from God. Right? That's, that's what this is about. We are a people from God on a mission from God to bring the kingdom of God and the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ to people who have not yet had that meeting or that experience of meeting Jesus and receiving eternal salvation and living within the kingdom of God. That is why we are here. And sometimes there are things that we get into little ways of doing things, that we get used to doing things certain ways, and this is just the way we've always done things, right? So this is just the way that things ought to be done. And so what happens is if somebody then comes along and puts a challenge to some of those things that we treasure, <coughs> we get nervous, or we get irritated, or we say, no, that's, that's not the way we do things here. But sometimes, we as a people need to constantly be in a, a position to reevaluate why we do things, the things that we do, the, the ways in which we do certain things, the way in which we operate on the mission of God. Now, the mission of God thing, that is not in question. That is who we are. That is what we do. There is no excuse not to participate in the mission of God. What is up for discussion is the how. What is up for discussion is the method. What is up for discussion is the ways in which we do various things. Do we do things more what we would call traditional? Do we do things in a more contemporary style? And do we realize that when we say traditional, for somebody that was new at one point in history? And so these are questions that I want us to sort of think about as we read through uh, the first part of what we're going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So we're going to start in ch uh, chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. Chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. And so also to remind you of a little bit what we've been discussing in this particular portion of 1 Corinthians is this discussion of sometimes we have this concept or understanding of freedom or I have rights. 
And so I should just exercise my freedoms or I should exercise my rights. But one of the things that Paul has been telling us in this passage or in this particular book is there are times where we set those aside in favor of the benefit of the kingdom of God and the benefit of those who are not yet part of that kingdom. There are rights, there are freedoms that we don't always access, that we don't always use to our fullest extent because there may be ways in which that could be harmful for somebody else's entrance into the kingdom of God. And so we have to be discerning about how we use those freedoms and how we use those rights. And he's going to continue that discussion in the, the section that we're about to read. So chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. That I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul continues his discussion of purposeful restrictions. Purposeful restrictions on freedom. And he frames it now in terms of a discussion of this is what the mission of God looks like. This is how Paul says, I participate in the mission of God. This is my, what he's doing for us is he's giving us in a sense, or in a very small sort of capsulated picture, his missionary method. How does Paul encounter and engage with those who are very unlike him? How does he encounter and engage with people who are very like him or very familiar to his background? He will do that differently for each different kind of person or each different kind of sort of maybe category of people that he runs into and that he has opportunity to talk with about Jesus and about the good news of the kingdom of God that has come and is available to all if we simply say yes to Jesus. God created the church to promote his mission. That is why we are here. Sometimes we think that it that the church is here so that I can feel good about myself. Sometimes we think the church is here so that I get to sing the songs that I like to sing. Sometimes we think the church is here so that I can be with people who are kind of like-minded with me. Sometimes we think the church is here to fulfill my needs. Sometimes we think the church is here to be a purveyor of religious goods and services, and it is not. It is not. The church is not a store. The church is not a warehouse. The church is the epicenter of God's mission in this world. That is why we are here. That is why we do all of the things that we do. If we sing, we sing for the glory of the kingdom of God. If I preach, I preach for the glory of the mission of the kingdom of God. If we give announcements, it's to announce the ways in which we are being and living in the kingdom of God. This is why we do all things that we do. The mission of God informs every last detail of every last activity of what we do. And if at any point we find that the mission of God is absent from our activity, we ought to stop. We ought to give up the things that we do if it is not for the kingdom and mission of God. I am not here because I felt like this would be a good, comfortable place 
for me to be. Comfort doesn't enter the discussion. Now, it does enter the discussion if somebody has been hurt, if somebody has been damaged, if somebody has been, um, uh, has been caused some pain. We are there to comfort that kind of a person, but we are not here to, to be comfortable. I've heard it said so once that, and I love the way that the, some of, there was a pastor who said, I am there to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> right? Sometimes that's what we need. Sometimes we need somebody to stand up and to remind us, no. Mission, no. Gospel, no. We're here for Jesus, not yourself. I am not here because this fills one of my needs. Now, that may happen in the process, right? There's nothing wrong with that. We're not saying, let's not fill anybody's needs. Let's not address anybody's pain. Let's not address anybody's hurt or address anybody. We're not saying that. What we're saying is that that gets pulled along in the activity of the mission of the kingdom of God. All of that gets addressed, but it gets addressed in the framework of this larger thing called the kingdom of God and the mission that Jesus gave to us. So he gives us a little bit of his method. He says, I become like. There are two words that he uses in here sort of over and over and over again, which probably means we ought to take note of them. To the Jew, I became like a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who were without the law, I became like those who were without the law, in order to win those without the law. For those who are under the law, I became like those who are under the law, that I might be able to win some of those who are under the law. To the weak, I became weak. To this, I became that. To these people, I became this. And he says, this is for a purpose. I do this for a reason. We do it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why. And so, illustrating the way in which we address the world. We address the world in very specific, regimented sorts of ways. And sometimes that means it is going to be uncomfortable for us. Do you think when Paul who was seriously like one of the most, before Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, he was like the strictest Shamite Pharisee Jew on the block. And it is to this kind of man that God says, I'm going to send you on a mission, not to the Jewish people, but primarily to Gentile people. Do you think that probably made Paul maybe a little bit uncomfortable? I don't know how to talk to those people. I know, how, I know this language here. I know all of the appropriate terms to use in this context, but I don't know how to talk to those guys. How do I do that? And so sometimes what it means to be on the mission of God is we suspend comfort. We suspend freedom. We suspend rights in able to make that leap to be able to go up to somebody who does not know Jesus and say, have you heard the good news. Well, what do you mean by good news? And in that interaction with that particular person, whoever it is, whatever their background, whatever it is they are like, however they define themselves, those are going to be the terms upon which we have to address them. Because we can't start throwing theological terms at people who don't know them, can we? If I were to say to somebody, well, what you need to believe is that Jesus came and it was a hypostatic union of two natures, both holy God and holy man, and that he died to be a propitiation for your sins so that you might be justified and enter into the kingdom of God fully, how about that would you like to say yes to Jesus? <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> what? What? No, see, what we do, and we do this on kind of an, on a sort of a subconscious level probably, is we realize that there are certain ways that we have to talk to certain people and certain ways that we don't talk to them as well. There are certain words that, that are just not helpful. There are certain terminologies that just aren't going to be beneficial in that particular conversation. So what we, as people on the mission of God, get to do is stop and think about the way in which we say things and the way in which we interact with people. Because 
what can often happen, I think very unfortunately, is we get this sort of superiority complex. Oh, I've been saved. Ha <laughs> ha, God loves me. I am favored by God. And what that then translates into is, I'm going to save this one. I'm going, I'm responsible for seeing this one come to Jesus. And there, if you, if you enter, have you ever noticed when somebody enters into a conversation with you and they're being all superior, you shut down? Don't you? I do. Roll your eyes. Right? Okay. Bear that in mind. When we talk with people about Christ, when we talk with people about the gospel, when we talk with people about the mission, when we talk with people about the kingdom, how do we talk to them is as important as the content which we relate. Because if we relate in a way that is unrelatable, we have done them a disservice. And we have done a disservice to the kingdom of God. So Paul says, I become like. I become like sort of a chameleon in some ways in his missionary method. He takes on, if you go, if you read through the book of Acts, for example, if you come to the book of Acts and you read Acts chapter 17, when it says he goes to Mars Hill or the Oropagus and he starts talking to the philosophers on Mars Hill, he does a number of very fascinating things. He points to their culture of idolatry that which they are familiar with. And he notes that they have a, an altar to an unknown God, and there's a lot of interesting sort of history behind that. But he points to something they're familiar with, and he says, the God that you worship there that is unknown, I know that one. He uses something that is familiar to them. He also does something else. He uses pagan philosophers and poets. He says, in him we live and move and have our being. He's quoting the a, a pagan philosopher who is actually talking about Zeus in that quote. And he hijacks it. And he says, actually, in him, in Yahweh, in God, we live and move and have our being. And so he, what does he do? He addresses them in their cultural situation, in their own terms. He speaks to them in a way that is understandable to them. Do you think that that would have been something that he would have been really comfortable with initially? Probably not. There are things that we need to suspend. There are freedoms and rights we set aside. There are ways in which we live and move and have our being that we need to put a different spin on, not to change the content of what we're talking about, but the method in which that content is delivered. Because the mission is central, and this is the fascinating thing about the mission, is the mission has stayed the same for thousands of years, but it has gone through a continuing conversion process all throughout those 2,000 years as well. When they first met, they were meeting in public areas. They were meeting in people's homes. They were meeting in all sorts of places. They did not first meet in a building that was dedicated to their meeting. That came much later. If you have ever been in a church that uses traditional pews, you are in a church that is on the cutting edge of the culture of the 12th century because that's when those things were added into the mix of how those things were done. If you are ever in a church that used musical instruments, those came in later. And it's not to say that those are invalid. It is to say that those simply reflect the cultural situation in which the mission is moving forward. And so what it would behoove us to think about, to stop and think, what are the dominant and important cultural linguistic methods that might be helpful for us to consider in our communication of the good news? What are the methods that need to be revisited? What are the 
things that we are probably very comfortable with that made sense 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago, but might not make as much sense today. One of the things that you will often hear is a critique of the Church of Jesus Christ is that, man, those people are stuck in the past. And in some ways we are, and that's good. Because the, the ancient truth of the mission is powerful and good and beautiful and ought not to be tampered with. But there are things also that are ancient that maybe have gone on for too long, that have maybe stuck around for a while, that need to be revisited, that need to be really looked at. The content, the core, the heart of the good news has been the same since day one. But the method, the means by which it has gone out, has gone through, there's no way to, to tally how many changes have occurred simply in the method. The transformations of the, the way in which it has gone out, there's no way to count because it has just been counted. Because as many people have been reached by Jesus, that's as many different ways as the gospel has been communicated. No two people do it precisely the same, or no two people hear it precisely the same. We consider, we think about, we reevaluate the ways in which we do or are on the mission of God. All of us are on the mission of God if we have said yes to Jesus. But I imagine that if any one of us were to sit down with one person and talk with them about Jesus, each of us would probably do it just a little bit differently. Now, we might all use the same basic sorts of forms, but the words and the language and the style and the approach and the way of communication might differ greatly from person to person to person. And that is just fine. And that's okay. This is sacrificial because it requires suspension of comfort and freedoms to benefit those who are on life. sacrificial because it requires suspension of freedom and comfort to benefit those who are unlike us. This is one of Jesus' biggest critiques of the religious establishment which he addressed. You guys, you lay all these burdens on these people, but you don't lift a finger to help them. I have come not to call the healthy, but the sick. Not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Those who are vastly different from you and We are here to benefit, greatly benefit, with the eternal gospel and power those who are very different from us. Because this is what often happens if you've been a Christian for any length of time. You begin to assume, assume and assimilate into kind of a subculture, which is the Christian bubble, that has its own sort of ways of speaking and doing things. Amen, brother. Nobody says that outside of church unless it's a joke. Right? And I'm not dogging on that. I'm not dogging on that language, but do be mindful of the ways in which we speak with each other and with other people. These are this is sacrificial. There are times when we are simply going to have to sacrifice our own comfort to be able to speak with somebody who's very unlike us. And that's not to say that that's sort of a magical cure-all and that will make people listen to us. It won't. That takes the Holy Spirit pulling that person along to be able to say, there's something here. Your method, your own way of, of approaching another person on the mission of God is important, but it's not the end of the world. God is involved in this thing, too. It is his mission. These are things that we consider. All right, next section. Chapter 24 through 27. Chapter, or sorry, chapter 9, verse 24 through verse 27. It's going to be a long section for the chapters. <laughs> Terrible. It doesn't go that far in chapters. Uh, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only 
one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul says that following Jesus on his mission is going to mean something. And this is a word that we get nervous around. It says it's going to lead to a disciplined life. And here some of you cringe internally at the word discipline. Mm, I don't know about that. Because culturally, culturally, our, the culture outside the church has vastly rejected the idea of discipline. Maybe personally, like those people who are like super high achievers in, in, in areas, like, yeah, discipline, good, great. But for the most part, I think people hear that word discipline and a number of things kind of float to the surface that make them sort of nervous. We hear the word discipline, we hear the word punishment uh, sort of floating around there, which should, we shouldn't hear. Discipline isn't punishment. Discipline isn't trying. Discipline is training. That's what discipline is. To live a life that follows Jesus on the mission of Jesus in and through and for the kingdom of God means that there are certain areas of our lives that we are going to have to bring under discipline. And that's a, it's actually a very, very good thing. Followers of Jesus were first called what? Disciples. How many of you think of yourself as Christian? How many of you think of yourself first and foremost as a disciple? And if, if that was, is a word that immediately floats to your mind, go ahead and raise your hand. If it's not, don't. The word disciple shows up in the New Testament 269 times. The word Christian shows up three times. When we think Christian, we tend to think status. Static. It's simply a label that defines a certain maybe set of intellectual, philosophical, religious sorts of beliefs. I believe, I intellectually assent to certain things. The reason disciple is probably a better word is because it implies discipline. It implies training. These are the people who first followed Jesus. They said, whatever you do, that's what we want to do too. That's what the word disciple would mean. If you were a first century Palestinian Jew living in the land of Israel, okay? and you saw a rabbi, what we would sometimes see is a little flock of kind of younger people following that rabbi, maybe from kind of the preteen years and up. And what those people who were following that rabbi would be doing is they, those were his disciples. That rabbi, that teacher would have disciples. And all of those little people, all of those preteen and up sorts of people were trying to be like their rabbi. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It isn't simply, simply somebody who says, I believe these things about Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is somebody who says, I am following Jesus because I want to be like Jesus. Do you ever wonder why Peter steps out of that boat and walks out of the water? Peter, what are you thinking? Why does he think he can walk on water? Because he sees his rabbi doing That's why Peter gets out of the boat, because he sees his rabbi doing something, and if my rabbi does it, I want to do it too. There's really no other rational explanation for that, is there? Because if I'm in a boat and I see somebody walking on water, I turn the boat around and I sail the other direction. Because <laughs> something's not right about that. Even if it's somebody I know, 
See you later, Frank. I'll catch up with you on the shore. <laughs> but Peter steps out of that boat because he sees his rabbi doing something, and he says, I want to do that too. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, somebody who follows Jesus, somebody who sees the things that Jesus are doing, Jesus does, and says, I want to be like that. That's the kind of character, those are the kinds of things that I want to be doing. Jesus is being good and kind and feeding people and helping people and saving people. I want to be involved in that mission. I want to be on that mission. I want to be involved in that process. I want to say yes to Jesus, not simply for myself, not simply for my personal eternal salvation. That's a benefit and a side effect. The real purpose behind saying yes to Jesus is so that we can advance his mission, not our position. That is why we do this here and now. Because we are on his mission, not ours. We are here for the benefit of others, not ourselves. We are here because we have said yes to Jesus. And in saying yes to Jesus, we have said yes to his mission and his kingdom and his way of doing things. And sometimes that means we're going to be uncomfortable in the process. Can you imagine the disciples were pretty uncomfortable at points? Frequently. Like pretty much all the time. You know, read some of the stuff that happens in the Gospels, and if you are a living, breathing, normal human being, and if you were there, you would say, uh, I don't know about this. Jesus takes his disciples through Samaria. You wouldn't go to Samaria if you were a Jew. That's unclean land. Sounds like a really bad amusement park, doesn't it? Why don't you unclean land? <laughs> they wouldn't want to go through there, but Jesus says, well, that's where we're going. He takes them to a place called Caesarea Philippi. That's the, uh, that's the place where Jesus says, uh, where, where Peter makes his confession, um, you are the Christ. He says, who do you say that I am? He says, I am the Christ. And, and Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, Simon, uh, son of Simon, for um, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What's fascinating about Caesarea Philippi is this. There is a place in Caesarea Philippi where they worshipped the goat god named Pan, very Greco-Roman sort of thing to do. And there was an actual location of worship where there was a giant sort of rock. And there was a crack in this rock that went deep down into the earth and sulfurous fumes poured out of it. And that place became known as the gates of hell. Wait a minute. Blessed are you, Simon. Peter, son of Simon. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is Jesus doing? First of all, he's making his disciples very uncomfortable and taking them there in the first place. Why are we here? This isn't kosher. We shouldn't be here. But second, he's using the familiar surroundings and environments to make a statement about his mission and his kingdom. This is the kind of place, yes, even here, where my church will root and the gates of hell, this kind of thing that's going on here now is not going to be able to prevail against it. He uses the familiar settings and he makes a statement. He sort of, once again, he hijacks it. And he says, this is the sort of place where it's going to go down. And you're not going to believe what God's going to do here. It's going to be amazing. Just central idea of discipline is a rigorous experiential training of mind and body to live like our teacher Jesus. Let me say that again. The central idea of discipline is a rigorous experiential training of mind and body to live like our teacher Jesus. 
That means it's more than just sitting in a class and memorizing facts about the Bible. It's experiential, which means we actually have experience of God. We, we make an effort to actually intentionally connect with God. We spend time with God. We experience God. That's what the disciples did. In spending time with Jesus, they were spending time with God in human flesh. That's a defining characteristic of being a disciple. It's a rigorous, experiential training of the mind and body to live like our teacher, Jesus. That throws out the window so many of the ways in which the American church has done church for hundreds of years. And not just the American church, the Western church in general, and has infected a lot of the rest of the world with. Here, sit in this class and learn these facts. No, that is not the first thing that we do to disciples, new brand new disciples of Jesus. The first thing we do to brand new disciples is, here, let me help you meet Jesus better. Help me meet you, let me help you meet God better. This is how we pray. It's discipline. It's rigorous and experiential. It is a training of the mind and the body to live like our teacher, our rabbi, our master, our friend, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus. This is what it means to be a disciple. Say yes to Jesus on so many levels, not just a personal salvation level. That's just the beginning. That's just the start. It's a minor fraction of living the life of the kingdom of God. If we, if we leave it there, we miss out on so much. So much. This isn't about law versus grace because it can turn into that. Well, it's discipline. I thought we weren't under the law. We were under grace. Yeah, this isn't about law and grace. <coughs> this isn't about being forced to do certain things in a certain way. What this is about is fruitfulness versus fruitlessness. Do we live a life that is fruitful for the mission of God? If not, something has gone awry. If not, we are, we've messed something up somewhere along the line. If we are living in a way that is not producing fruit, and this is one of the things Jesus said, they're going to know you by your fruit. If we are not producing in our lives, producing, I guess you could say, fruit, for the good news, for the gospel, for the kingdom of God, something is something's gotten off track. We've gotten so enamored with some little gimmicky thing somewhere along the line that is not beneficial for the kingdom of God and for those who are unlike us. How do we do this? How do, how do we get to a place where that's actually normative? Because in many ways, that is normative. It's I opened that question to begin with. How many of you would consider that you are an active member of the kingdom mission of God? How many of you are a disciplined, active member? How many of us, um, me included, are experiencing the life of the kingdom of God here and now? And, and if the answer is, like, I guess not me, we've missed something. And it's not a shame thing. Don't hear this as a, mm, naughty. Don't hear that. Hear that as a, oh, we've gotten off course. Well, let's get back on course. That's all that means. That's all that has to be is, if we're not doing it now, let's start. Let's start. Let's get on. Let's do that disciplined life thing. And there are countless ways to do that. There are, there are multiple traditions of discipline.
discipline that have sort of been developed based on the, the, what we read in the scriptures over the last several centuries. Prayer is a primary discipline, yes? And how many of us would say, yeah, it takes discipline to do prayer? Yeah, all of us, I imagine. This is one of the things I really appreciated about my time on my uh, pastoral internship 11 years ago. Of course, that was one of the first things that the pastor who I did my internship with and I would do every day was we'd spend an hour in prayer. And it was, life was different. Life was different. There's prayer. There's meditation on the scripture. There is all sorts of, there, there, are, there are disciplines we do corporately. There are disciplines we do individually. There are disciplines that are there to kind of integrate who we are, mind, body, soul. There are disciplines for simply, this is how I do the way of Jesus. This is how I'm on the mission. This is how I benefit other people. And it's not simply about, well, I guess I just have to do, I have to do, I have to do. It's about that doing that actually turns into a transformation formation of character if it is done the appropriate way. I guarantee you, if you spend like an hour a day in prayer, serious, just sitting with God in prayer, you're going to change. You're going to change. You will not be the same person a year from now as you are today. Because you will be spending time with God. If you discipline yourself and actually do the discipline of reading scripture daily, that'll rub off. That'll rub off. It'll have an effect. You will not be the same person much later as you are now. And that's kind of like the goal. That's the goal for us to become more and more like Jesus on his mission. And the more we become like Jesus, the more we're likely to be on his mission. It's just the reality of it. There are lots of different resources I could recommend you. If you're a book person, I can recommend at least three resources that might be helpful. The first one is uh, um, just like, okay, Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. He, he goes through each of um, uh, I think it's like 12 separate disciplines um, and, so, and sort of explains them. This is scripturally where that sort of originates from. This is what it sort of looks like to do that. This is how people in the past have sort of practiced it. So the Spirit of the Disciplines by Richard Foster is a really, really, really good one. Um, the Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard. Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard. A little bit more of a higher level sort of thing, so don't try to tackle that one right away. If you're on a sort of a, I don't like to read a lot, um, John Ortberg has a book that I just got and just started reading, it's very good, called The Life You've Always Wanted, um, and there's uh, there's quite a bit of a lot in there that is uh, sort of helpful. So that's just some uh, resources that are available to you out there uh, if you're interested in looking further into this idea of discipline. There is tremendous freedom. Tremendous freedom in discipline, which seems sort of counterintuitive, does it not? Well, if I'm disciplined, that seems very narrow. Seems very, yeah, but here's the problem. If we are undisciplined, do you know what happens? Nothing. A person who is undisciplined leads a virtually paralyzed life. This is why so many people don't do things. There's no discipline. Um, you know, many of you know that I like to write. Um, that's just sort of a, and writing that includes a lot of discipline. But uh, there's a book called Story by a screenwriting guru named Robert McKee. And one of the things that he talks about in that book that I found very helpful just in my writing, but also you know, if you apply it to a broader sort of life level, it's pretty brilliant, is there's this thing called creative limitations. If you're writing, um, you, you set, like, this is where I'm going, and you set all sorts of little obstacles in the way of your characters or whatever that they have to overcome. If you have writer's block, this is a very helpful sort of exercise to participate in because what it does is it gives your character something to do. It boxes and hems them in, gives them a limit, and it enables them and spurs your 
your character on to be able to act. The same thing is true in your life. If you don't have a discipline, if you don't have a thing to overcome, if you don't have a little obstacle in your way, odds are you're not going to do anything. That's why the disciplines are sometimes very freeing, actually, because it wakes us up and enables us to say, well, there's more here to do. We think of freedom in terms of license to just kind of do whatever it is we feel like doing. That is not freedom. That is actually slavery because it paralyzes us. It's interesting. If you talk to a missionary who has been overseas in a third world country and they come home and they go to shop at a, at a supermarket and they're like, uh, they're confronted with a wall of like peanut butter or ketchup various different kinds, what you'll find them talking about frequently is, I don't know what to do. Because there's just so many choices available to me. And they get paralyzed by the abundance of choices. But if I only have one choice, well, that's all I need. And I can get going with that. We narrow our lives as we discipline our lives the various disciplines that are available to us in Christ, in the scripture, and throughout sort of kind of ancient Christian tradition, what we will find is that actually enables us to live a lot freer than we are living now because we don't feel like we have to participate in everything. Have you ever met somebody who feels like they have to do everything around them? And usually means they don't do anything very well. There are things that we simply say no to. That's a discipline. Saying no here means sometimes saying yes here. Saying yes to this means I say no to this, that, and the other. There's a tremendous amount of freedom in discipline. Lives without discipline are not lives of freedom. They're lives of paralysis and they are unproductive. We want to live, lead lives that are fruitful for God's mission in the world we will incorporate discipline. And some questions for reflection it should be printed for you in your bulletin. Questions for reflection. Question number one. Paul sacrificially became like those he was trying to win. Understanding that the church is made for God's mission, what might this mean for our present ways of being and doing church?
it's like it's hard for everybody, but God, I know the beauty and joy of, of feeling those disciplines at work, and God, remind me, show us for the first time if necessary, those things that we need to take upon ourselves, the ways in which we say yes to say no to lots of other things, so that your kingdom may advance in this place, so that the Rockaway Community Church would be an epicenter of your mission in this place, and that nobody would mistake us 